So hello there. So we're going to take a look at the history of herbs today. So if you look back in, in time in the ancient antiquity and the, um, all the manuscripts that are out there, you'll find that herbs are found all throughout history, whether it's the Chinese, the um, Egyptians, the Babylonians, ancient Greeks and Romans, or here in North America, the Native Americans, they're found all across the globe. People have used herbs for healing, all kinds of things throughout history. And so I'm just going to walk you through some of the basics about some of the historical things. So we'll give you a good perspective on things that you're going to learn about in the home herbalist class. So um, the earliest information that I could find that was actually recorded in history was some ancient cave paintings that were found in France. And they were dated back supposedly into 13,000 BC and 25,000 BC. Well, that's a really, really long time. So actually what they were speculating, the scientists and the experts were speculating that the early humans probably discovered the Miramad, the variety of uses of wild plants, basically through trial and error. Whether this is true or whether it was from a divine inspiration, um, I guess it remains to be seen. And regardless, um, information was definitely passed on down from generation to generation. And there's a lot of biblical references to herbs in the, in the Bible as well. So um, herbs have a rich history. And anthropologists really um, believe that, that people were making healing ointments out of fragrant plants, like essential oil type things, way back as early as 7,000 BC. And so if we look back um, about 5,000 years ago, they have found clay tablets that were written by the ancient Sumerians that were actually found in Mesopotamia, and that's the Iraq area of today. And then in 1550 BC, they found actually something called the Ebers Papyrus. And that is a listing of over 800 herbs and essential oils that were recorded about some of their uses and um, what they did for healing purposes with that. So that's pretty interesting. So that is where some of the first written records occurred. And actually by 700 BC, a lot of the Greek merchants were doing all kinds of things with herbs, more so cooking herbs like marjoram, thyme, and sage. There were a ton of markets and things happening in the Athens area. And so then one of the major milestones that comes next is Hippocrates. And I'm sure everybody has heard of Hippocrates. Hippocrates was alive from 460 to 377 BC. And he is known as the father of modern medicine. And you've probably heard that familiar um, saying or a familiar quote, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Well, that's from Hippocrates. And he used many, many plants to treat diseases. And then he became thus known as the father of modern medicine. And actually, he ended up cataloging about 400 herbs for common use in his day while he was alive. And still to this day, physicians use a Hipp Hipp Hippocratic Oath um, where you do no harm to people. And um, he developed this because a lot of the herbs did not do any harm. They were very safe and effective. So then that brings us up to the, one of the next stepping points in history with the herbal medicine up to 1600 AD. And that's when they started isolating different um, plant compounds known as isolates. And at that time, the herb, herbs of the field and herbs and growing in the wild were used for the poor, while the extracts of the plants, minerals and animals were used for the rich. And that was one of the differentiating factors. So the commoners used the herbal medicine and then the so-called elite used something that they thought was better. And then um, I wanted to tell you about um, 
the English physician, Nicholas Culpepper. And that was a big thing in herbal medicine. That was actually 1616 to 1654 when, er, when um, Nicholas Culpepper was alive. And he was an English physician who really believed that the herbal medicine should be made known to all. And so he recorded um, all kinds of stuff. And there's a book available today. Um, it's called Culpepper's Complete Herbal. And it's pretty interesting because it is just worded exactly like it was in the 1600s. And he goes through all kinds of plants. Culpepper's Herbal. And most um, herbalists kind of like to keep a copy of this on hand because it's so interesting to go back on what they used in the 1600s. And a lot of it is still very effective today. So from there, we get into um, more of the North American herbalism stuff where the European colonists settled to the new world. And that was in the 16 and 1700s. And with them, they carried their seeds that were very prized possessions to them. So remember, they were very limited with luggage that they were um, able to bring on these ships when they were coming to the New World. But it was very critical for them to bring things like plantain seeds, dandelion seeds, mint, lavender, parsley. None of those types of plants were native to North America. We have our ancestors, our early settlers to thank for that. So they brought that to the New World and transported it to their new homes, planted it everywhere. And today, the, the, these types of plants are just very, very abundant. They even brought like yarrow and thyme, roses, chamomile, and a plant called calendula, which they called pot marigold. So once they settled um, a lot of them and they started cultivating these herbs, they um, wanted to put these plants or their herb gardens really close, just outside their front door. So if you've ever gone to some of the, you know, museum type things or some of the shakers, the American shaker um, gardens, you'll find them very, very close to the homes. And they would just go um, quickly out to the garden, collect their herbs that they could use for culinary plants and use that in cooking. And they had pretty interesting, a lot of them were very well-groomed and well-kept and symmetrical and it's really fun to visit these shaker gardens and you can just think back in time and how things might have been. And about that same time, as the settlers were um, continuing to use the herbs, they learned a lot of things from the Native Americans that they encountered. Um, I'll give you a few examples. So like the Cherokees, they showed the new settlers how to use goldenrod to treat fevers. And the Sioux Indians or Native Americans showed the frontier settlers how to use echinacea to treat wounds and snake bites. Black cohosh was used for mental menstrual cramps. Now these were all plants that were North American natives and they were shared and they started using roots and barks and leaves for teas. Um, some of the earliest recorded examples of these include sage, um, chicory, lemon balm, and then dandelion as well from the early settlers. So that's a really interesting. And herbs were very, very important, actually extremely important before clinics or hospitals even existed. You know, doctors weren't available to everyone. People had to um, take care of themselves and be self-sufficient. And so the common people really use plants and plant parts for treating different ailments. Um, a lot of the plants were dried and stored so that they were able to use them in the winter months. And um, there really wasn't a lot of formal research other than like the trial and error types of things. And that really resulted, resulted from passing um, the information through word of mouth from generation to generation. An interesting historical um, uh, tidbit is that Thomas Jefferson, he was also a gardener who kept records of his gardens at Monticello. 
And some of the herbs that he grew included lemon balm, sage, mint, thyme, chamomile, rosemary, and lavender. It's always fun to hear a little bit of the history and see what our ancestors did. So then as we move forward through the time a little bit, we get to the 1800s. And um, during that time, that's when the pharmaceuticals barely began to hit the scene and the herbals started to take a backseat to medicine. Um, but the pharmaceuticals at that time were like mercury. Um, that's when they did some bloodletting, you know, put the leeches on there and they sucked the blood out. They believed that if you had the new blood, you'd be good. Um, purging. So there were all kinds of different things that they considered were modern medicine at that time, but they did have side effects. And as these side effects began to be documented, pretty interesting because then herbal medicine and herbal remedies then became popular once again. And so then as you move on to the 1800s into the early 1900s, that's when I think um, a lot of this herbal medicine in North America really was interesting because herbs were very, very widely used. And there was a group of physicians called the eclectics, the eclectic physicians. They were very, very common they were trained at the medical schools and they essentially used whatever worked you know like think it as an eclectic if you're a decorator you put this piece and that piece together well that's what the eclectic physicians did they they found out what worked they knew what worked from the native americans whether it, um, they worked with homeopathy or the herbs or naturop naturopathy naturopathy, however you want to pronounce that, osteopath, or even chiropractic. So they combined a lot of stuff together, and they did that besides the traditional herbalisms. And in this eclectic group of physicians, that's when um, there were first women graduates from the medical schools and the first black graduates. So it was a pretty important time for America to get this, you know, new wave of medicine to, to the people and um, the practitioners. But then the training kind of changed when it came to about 1940. And that's when herbal treatments were pulled out from the medical school training due to the pressure by the American Medical Association, also known as AMA. So when AMA formed, they started shut, shutting down all kinds of herbal schools, and they really wanted to focus on the pharmaceuticals, and they introduced a lot of synthetic medicines, things that they could create in labs, things that people could not just go out in their backyard and find. Um, so it became more difficult for people to help themselves. They had to rely upon um, something that was made by um, commercially and in the lab, uh, basically a pharmaceutical. But then again, there was a resurgence of self-sufficiency movements kind of in the 1960s, um, the whole Woodstock thing, the hippie movement, and people became interested in herbs once again. And then there was a bit of a lull, but now today, you know, in the, in the, 2000s now we're 2020 all already and there's huge new interest in in herbal medicine and people wanting to revive what our ancestors did i think from like 2000 on for the last 20 years there's been a big push for this and a lot more people wanting to go back to how things were so truly throughout the years and years of herbal medicine the plants, botanical medicine has stood the test of time and it has, un, all of the plants have undeniable healing power. And as you delve into the home herbalist class, you'll be amazed too of all of the things that are really simple out there in your backyard of things you can use for yourself and your family. Thanks for listening and um, get outside and start collecting plants.